Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Dear students, today we are going to talk about trauma and stress related disorders and especially in the current era of COVID-19, these stress related disorders have become even more important. So the learning objectives of today's talk would be that by the end of the lecture, you should be able to list various stress related disorders. You should be able to know the clinical features of three most common stress related disorders, which include acute stress disorders, post traumatic stress disorders and adjustment reaction. Basic principles of management of trauma and st stress related disorders would also be discussed. And towards the end, it's extremely important to know about the basic principles of psychological first aid. So what do we mean by trauma and stress related disorders? In the new DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual um, fifth edition by the American Psychiatric Association, all these disorders are now considered as a separate new category. And these include disorders in which exposure to a traumatic event or stressful event is listed explicitly as a diagnostic criteria. There are five disorders in this category, including acute stress disorder, PTSD, adjustment disorder, and then there are reactive attachment disorders and disinhibited social engagement disorders. We would be discussing the first three, which are more important related to uh, this topic. When we are talking about traumatic events, these could be any extremely stressful, uh, threatened death, serious injury, or any other traumatic events, for example, uh, exposure to war, either as a civilian or as a soldier, then threatened or actual assault, which could be physical, which could be sexual assault, then natural and man-made disasters, for example, floods, earthquake, terrorist attacks, all these disasters lead uh, to trauma-related symptoms, severe accidents, as well as industrial accidents are also considered to be traumatic events. So this is by no means a comprehensive list, but when we are talking about traumatic events, generally we are talking about any of these disorders. Exposure to these can increase the chances of a person having stress and trauma related disorders. So let's first talk about the acute stress disorder. Now acute stress disorder is mainly distinguished from the PTSD by the duration of the symptoms. So the characteristic symptoms begin within three days of exposure to one or more traumatic events and last within uh, for about a month. Some of these patients who have acute stress disorder, they may progress to post-traumatic stress disorder, but in many cases, symptoms do remit within one month following the event. Symptoms profile do vary cross-culturally like in countries like Pakistan and subcontinent, we do see much more dissociative and somatic symptoms compared to West. Then developmental level also um, affects how these uh, symptoms present, like in younger children, regression of the milestones which they have achieved. For example, if the child has started drinking milk from a cup, the child may would like to be have bottle, thumb sucking, bed wetting. So regression of these behaviors, as well as increased fear, irritability, loss of appetite, more clinginess to the caregivers could be symptoms of acute stress disorder. When we talk about risk factors, females are generally considered to be at higher risk of stress related disorders as well as anyone having prior history of psychiatric illness can uh, is more predisposed to develop acute stress disorder. For diagnosis of acute, DSM, uh, acute stress disorder in DSM-5, as we've already talked, there needs to be exposure to a stressor and it needs to be within the, uh, from three days to one month, the symptoms needs to be present following the exposure to that stressor. Then there are intrusion symptoms. These symptoms including intrus recurrent intrusive distressing memories of the traumatic event, recurrent distressing dreams in which the content and effect of the dream are related to the event. Sometimes dissociative reactions like flashbacks happen and there could be intense and prolonged psychological distress in uh, response to internal or external cues that resemble an aspect of the traumatic event. Then there could be negative mood in which there is persistent inability to experience positive emotions. We do see, as I mentioned earlier, dissociative symptoms in which uh, the person can be in, the, in a daze, 
there is altered sense of reality of one's surroundings or one's self. Then avoidance symptoms are also present. Efforts to avoid distressing memories, efforts to avoid external reminders like people, places, conversation, anything which is closely associated with a traumatic event. Arousal symptoms include uh, sleep disturbances like a uh, person may have difficulty falling or staying asleep or there is restless sleep. Irritable behavior and angry outbursts without little provocation also is one of the arousal symptoms, hypervigilance, problems with concentration, and increased startle response. So all these are the symptoms and presence of nine of any of these symptoms among these categories leads to diagnosis of acute stress disorder. Along with that, there needs to be significant impairment in a person's functioning and the symptoms should not be attributable to substance abuse or any other medical condition like mild traumatic brain injury and should not be explained by a brief psychotic disorder as well. So that is how you diagnose acute stress disorder and we are seeing this very common in uh, nowadays in our OPDs, in telepsychiatry consultations following the uh, COVID-19 epidemic and outbreak in Pakistan, we are seeing increased, pre uh, increased presentation of acute stress disorder in the public as well as in patients who already had previous psychiatric disorders. So that was the diagnostic criteria for acute stress disorder. Now let's move on to the post-traumatic stress disorder. Now when we are talking about post-traumatic disorder, as you see there is there are some of the symptoms they are overlap with the um, acute stress disorder, there needs to be exposure to a traumatic event, actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence or any other traumatic event which we've talked about earlier. There are intrusion symptoms, uh, one or more needs to be present which are associated with traumatic event like distressing memories, nightmares, flashbacks. There needs to be persistent avoidance of the stimuli associated with traumatic event. Then negative alteration in cognitions and mood also happens. Uh, there's dissociative amnesia, negative emotional state, fear, horror or guilt, decreased interest in prior activities. Then as we talked earlier, there are alterations in arousal and reactivity, which is also seen in these patients. However, looking at the duration, the symptoms above disturbance duration needs to be more than one month. So that is very where you are able to differentiate between acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. And as with all the other diagnoses, the symptoms needs to lead to clinically significant impairment in a person's functioning for diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. When we are talking about differential diagnosis of PTSD, um, the one is acute stress disorder and we've already discussed that the duration is the main differentiation feature. The other one is adjustment disorder. Adjustment disorder differs from uh, the other ones in that usually the severity of the stressor is not what we generally see in PTSD and the symptoms although there are some of the symptoms but the typical symptoms uh, which are seen in PTSD and acute stress disorder they are not present and we'll talk about adjustment disorder in a little detail in a while. Then anxiety disorders and obsessive compulsive disorders needs also need to be differentiated. However, again with anxiety there are panic feelings, with OCD there are recurrent thoughts but the typical intrusive and avoidance symptoms as well as the uh, exposure to a traumatic event is not present in these disorders. So on the basis of history and clinical examination you are able to distinguish them. Similarly, as with major depressive disorders, there are no typical intrusive avoidance and uh, hyperarousal symptoms and there is no exposure to uh, a traumatic event. However, in many cases, the major dep following a traumatic event, patient suffers from major depressive disorder rather than PTSD typical symptoms, in which case the major depressive diagnose, diagno uh, disorder is diagnosed and the treatment is done accordingly. In dissociative disorders, if the dissociative symptoms are present following a severe traumatic event and there are no other uh, arousal and typical and intr intrusive symptoms, so in those cases, dissociative disorders is the primary diagnosis. Then in psychotic disorders, sometimes there are perceptual abnormalities and they need to be distinguished with the flashbacks which are seen in PTSD. 
and in personality disorders some of the persons who have personality issues also respond to a traumatic event with PTSD like symptoms but again detailed history and uh, temporal association are important to distinguish these. So these are some of the differential diagnoses which we do consider when we are talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. The other category which we are going to talk about is the adjustment disorder. And for diagnosis, usually there is development of emotional and behavioral symptoms in response to an identifiable stressor occurring within three months of the onset of the stressor. There is distress which is out of proportion to the severity or intensity of the stressor. There is significant impairment in daily functioning of the person and the disturbance does not meet criteria for any other mental disorder. As you see, there are no presence of typical symptoms of hyperarousal, um, intrusion and so on. Usually we see these disorders like when person shift from one place to the other, when there is change in environment, sometimes school changes, sometimes diagnosis of an illness leads to um, adjustment disorder. And once the stressor or its consequences has terminated, the symptoms do not persist for more than an additional six months. So this is the diagnostic criteria for the adjustment disorder. Now let's talk about briefly about the treatment aspect of all the trauma and stress related disorders. Uh, psychoeducation is extremely important, uh, trying to educate the person and the family as to what is the diagnosis, what is the explanation for it, and trying to explain to them and listen to them about the nature of the illness and about what impact it can have it does lead to better compliance. Uh, psychological interventions are the mainstay of treatment and in that cognitive behavior therapy has got the most evidence. There is a specific type of CBT which is known as trauma focused cognitive behavior therapy in which the person is taught to relax to be able to build their own narrative of the trauma and then work through the emotional responses which are associated with it and has got significant evidence base for improvement in the symptoms. When we are talking about the pharmacological intervention, benzodiazepine generally should be avoided. There is quite strong evidence uh, for use of various SSRIs, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, as well as SNRIs and mirtazapine. So where needed, and especially when there is comorbid depression, in those cases, SSRIs helps a lot, along with the psychological work in treating these patients. In family therapy, as well as in the case of young children, parents need to be part of the therapy. So supportive work is also extremely helpful. And while sort of you are assessing the patient, the impact which the symptoms are having on the person's day-to-day -day life, they need to be addressed in order for better uh, improvement. So that was all regarding the three common uh, trauma-related disorders which we were going to discuss. But towards the end, I think it's extremely important for all the medical students as well as all the frontline workers, whether we are talking about uh, police, rescue double one double two, nurses, emergency uh, staff, to be aware of the basic principles of psychological first aid. Uh, just like in the case of physical health, we are talking about first aid and the purpose is to prevent the long-term complications as well as uh, decrease the intensity of the illness. Similarly, the purpose of psychological first aid is to provide support initially so that the long-term psychological consequences could be reduced. Now, it is a humane supportive response to a fellow human being who is suffering and who may need support. It involves various themes like providing practical care and support, which does not intrude. You need to assess the needs and concerns. It, is, it mainly deals with helping people to address basic needs in the case of any disaster, for example, food and water, provision of information. It involves listening to people but not pressuring them to talk comforting people and helping them to feel calm, helping people connect to information, services and social support and protecting people from further harm. And as you can see, these are very, very basic steps, but the evidence shows working on these things in the aftermath of any trauma does significantly lead to decreased risk of future psychological problems.
However, it's important to know what psychological first aid is not. It is not something that only professionals can do. Throughout the world, uh, nurses, doctors, uh, police workers, anyone who is dealing with people are trained to, uh, school teachers as well, are trained to know about the psychological first aid. It is not professional counseling, neither it is psychological debriefing. So that it does not necessarily involve a detailed discussion of the event which caused the distress. It's up to the person whether they feel comfortable about uh, talking about the event or not. Neither it is asking someone to analyze what happened to them and to put time and events in order. It just simply involves being available to listen to people's stories, but it's not about pressuring them to tell you how they should feel and how they should react to an event. These are the three basic principles of psychological first aid, look, listen and link. When we are talking about looking, it means looking for the people who are in distress, looking for the safety, first of all, before you approach anyone and uh, looking for anything which needs immediate attention. Listen principles, as we already mentioned, being there to listen if the person wants to talk, uh, listening to the nonverbal cues as well, both uh, verbal as well as nonverbal communication is extremely important listening to the people who are in extreme distress and who need immediate help and linking means linking to the basic um, facilities or basic support networks which are available around there which can help the people to feel more relaxed and more calm so these are the three principles which we need to follow when we are doing psychological first aid if you are interested in learning more about it the world health organization has got the whole uh, uh, psychological first aid manuals which have which is quite detailed looking at details of all these principles as well as some examples it's available in various languages including Urdu language as well so you can go to the WHO website just type psychological first aid and whichever language you prefer you can go through it because this is a tool which you need to know doesn't matter whichever specialty you are working in as a healthcare professional so that's all regarding today's topic. There will be reading material available as well. If you have any queries and any, or any question, you can let us know or you can email me at nazishimrandr at gmail.com. I'll be happy to answer any of your queries. Happy learning.